Good afternoon. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Business Ho Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee for today, uh, which is June 6th. I've been joined by a quorum of the committee, including council members Chugtai, Ellison, Rainville, and Chavez, which is a quorum of the committee. I'm going to start with uh, noting the consent items. They include number eight, which is the liquor licenses, and uh, item nine, which are the liquor license renewals. Item 10 are the gambling license approvals, and 11 is uh, Class A commercial parking lot legislative directive uh, item 12 is the preliminary housing revenue bond approval for 3030 Nicollet Avenue's affordable housing project item 13 is amendments to our ESG supplemental funding rapid rehousing recommendations and joint powers agreement item 14 is underwriting standards waiver for Emerson Village the affordable housing project item 15 is a contract amendment with MPHA regarding stable homes stable schools Item 16 is a grant application to the ASPA, ASPCA for their Northern Tier Shelter Initiative Program. Item 17 are Upper Harbor Terminal Development Terms and Appropriation. Item 18 is the Inclusionary Zoning Report and Unified Housing Policy. We are going to be discussing that also in item number 22. Item 19 is a water main and steward, sewer easement vacation at um, 31st and well, let's see, it's for Doran development between Hennepin Avenue and Fremont Avenue South. It's super distracting with the door, so. Could we, could we please close the door? <laughs> Item number 20 is rezoning for Little Earth. Item 21 is rezoning at Align Health Systems. So I am going to move the consent agenda, which is items 8 through 21. Is there any item anyone would like to pull off the agenda for discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Those items are approved. Now we'll move on to our long public hearing agenda, starting with item number one, uh, which is Hubba Hut, Hiba Hut. Someone will correct me. Uh, at 1125 Lagoon in the 10th Ward, and we'll have Mr. Olson give his presentation. Welcome, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Joseph Olson, Inspector for Business Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting the application today for the restaurant Chiba Hut, owned by Untethered Eats, LLC. This is an application of an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales and no live entertainment license. The business is located at 1125 Lagoon Avenue in Ward 10. <clears throat> the proposed hours of operation on the interior will be 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. and the exterior Sunday through Thursday will be open until 10 p.m. And Friday and Saturday until 11 p.m. <clears throat> Notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Notices were also sent to the Lowry Hill East Neighborhood Association and Council Member Shugtai. We've received one comment in support of the new business. There have been no complaints, 311 calls, or police calls associated with this business. Of course, construction has not yet been completed, but will be shortly. Uh, the License and Consumers Division recommends approval of the on-sale liquor with Sunday sales and no live entertainment license. This concludes my presentation. Um, we do have the operator, Mr. Tim Crouch, here available to introduce his business. Um, and I will stand for any comments or questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you for your report. Are there any comments or questions for Mr. Olson? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number one and invite Mr. Crouch to speak should he choose to do so. Welcome. Hi. Hi. My name is Tim Crouch. I'm the owner operator of Chiba Hut Toasted Subs. Um, we're a casual toasted sub shop. Um, we're excited to be coming to the uptown area to provide a safe place for people to get together and eat some good food. I'm excited about the opportunity. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here today and good luck to you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? 
Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Chugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really excited about this uh, this new business and and um, the continued work on revitalizing Uptown. Um, and I'm proud to move this item for approval. Item number one has been moved for approval. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number two, which is the mold ordinance. That sounds very exciting. <laughs> Mr. Velasquez, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Enrique Velasquez, the Director of Inspection Services for the city, presenting an ordinance amendment to Title 12, Chapter 244 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to the Housing Maintenance Code. Potential health risks associated with mold growth and excessive moisture may lead to increased allergic or respiratory issues, inflammation, and other adverse health effects. Those most vulnerable to these health impacts are children, elderly, and those living with underlying health conditions, whether they're known or unknown, who may have compromised immune systems, rendering it difficult to build sufficient immunity to combat these, um, the effects that mold or moisture might have. The purpose of the amendment is to incorporate proactive measures that will ensure safe and healthy living conditions. Uh, the amendment will enhance the housing maintenance code to include specific provisions for mold abatement. These provisions include first, requirement that exterior surfaces to building structures remain free from signs of visible mold or excessive dampness. Second, requirements that interior surfaces have no visible mold or excessive dampness. If there are signs of mold or excessive dampness, that any water damaged surfaces are either cleaned and repaired or removed and replaced. And the underlying root cause or causes of the mold growth and dampness are investigated, identified, and corrected. The third component is a requirement that rainwater and effluent are directed away from structures to reduce the risk of excessive moisture or dampness wicking um, on those exterior surfaces potentially creating the opportunity for mold growth. These additions to the Housing Maintenance Code demonstrate a commitment to improving living standards and ensuring the well-being of residents across our city. Further, these additions strengthen the Renters First policies already in place to protect the health and safety, um, to promote healthier living conditions and reduce property maintenance costs when moisture-related issues are identified and corrected early. This concludes my presentation, and I'll stand for any comments or questions you may have. Are there any questions or comments from Mr. Velasquez on item number two? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number two, and there are no people currently signed up to speak. I'll see if there's anyone in the room who forgot to sign up to speak that would like to speak now. Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, just want to thank staff. I want to thank Mr. Velasquez and his team. Uh, worked a lot with you over the years on everything from lead, now mold, you know, uh, and making sure that we don't only have a responsibility to make sure that we can, uh, that people can have affordable housing, but that that housing is dignified. And I think that this improvement to the code, this change to the code, uh, uh, really equips us to do that in a really important way. So I want to thank, uh, want to thank you for that. And uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, move approval of this uh, ordinance. Thank you for your comments and motion, Councilmember Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to echo Councilmember Allison's thanks, uh, Enrique. I know uh, you and, and many of your staff. I don't know how many how many in here today worked on this as well. All right, so thank you. This is thankless work, uh, but it's so important, and uh, we all deserve to breathe clean air in the city. So thank you for your work. On Councilmember Ellison's motion to improve, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number three. Uh, this is an administrative enforcement and hearing process ordinance change, and uh, it will be presented by Glenn Hassler. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Glenn Hasserud, and I am a management analyst with the Public Works Department's Administration Division. Uh, before you today are technical ordinance amendments uh, to expand and correct language surrounding the administrative enforcement and hearing process. Uh, the language amends three lines related to persons authorized and adds one line for offenses subject to enforcement within Title I, uh, Chapter 2 of the Municipal Code. Uh, the first uh, change modifies language uh, to include, quote, and their supervisor for uh, sidewalk inspectors. And this is to mirror the format of other job titles within public works uh, in subsequent lines of the ordinance. 
um, and it allows for a supervisor essentially to step into the role if and when there are vacancies. Uh, the second expands language to incorporate both Title 17 and 19, where the city engineer may designate uh, staff to enforce offenses captured within these titles. Uh, currently, only a specific chapter, number 511 of Title 19, is included. Uh, the third addresses an error observed by city clerk's office staff, uh, where Title 15, Chapter 405 is incorrect, incorrectly referenced um, as the conversion therapy ban ordinance, and this amendment uh, addresses it and changes it to 402. And then the fourth and final change is to add a new line in Chapter 2, Section 2.40, that adds Title 19, water, stormwater, and sanitary sewer as offenses subject to enforcement. So for some additional background, uh, the City Council adopted the Fats, Oils, and Grease, or FOG, ordinance back in 2018. Uh, this enforcement process is intended to educate restaurateurs and businesses that generate uh, FOG into their uh, wastewater and to uh, you know, ensure that they're aware that those discharges are in fact illegal. Um, so after a few years of refining what the process would look like, uh, the pandemic, uh, some staff turnover, and um, a moratorium that was lifted on system enhancements in 2021, uh, staff from Public Works, Surface Water and Sewers Administration, and uh, the Information Technology Department uh, built the enforcement mechanism in early 2022. And at this time, uh, because Title 19 uh, is not referenced in Section 2.40, um, it makes it questionable that staff can even issue citations uh, for the ordinance. So this amendment uh, is intended to address that. And with that, that is my, uh, the extent of my presentation, and I'm happy to stand by for questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to bring this to us today. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you for that report. We'll open the public hearing on item number three, which is um, some administrative enforcement and hearing process ordinance changes coming from Public Works. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Rainville. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I move approval of number four, please. Approval of number three speak, has speak, been speak. moved. I, I, I was tracking you. Um, for uh, item number three has been moved for approval. Are there further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number four. four. Ms. Shaw, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. You have before you a request to authorize host approval for the issuance of tax-exempt revenue bonds for the Metro Schools College Prep Charter School project located at 620 Olson Memorial Highway. Metro Schools is a Minneapolis charter school founded in 2005 with a mission of ensuring high school students are prepared for entering college. They relocated to the 620 Osa Memorial Highway location in 2017 and now serve kindergarten through 12th grade students. The city has received a request to authorize host approval of revenue bond financing by Public Finance Authority of Wisconsin for a pooled facilities transaction which includes the 620 Olsa Memorial property. Public Finance Authority will issue up to 300 million in revenue bonds to Oregon nonprofit Wonderful Foundations for the acquisition and improvements to several charter school facilities in various states. Since Metro Schools is located in Minneapolis, federal regulations and Wisconsin state statute require authorization of the host approval in order to issue those bonds. Wonderful Foundation back to Metro Schools. They will pay a host fee of $5,000 to Minneapolis per our conduit bond policy. And that concludes my presentation. And I do have a bond council here to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Shaw. Are there any questions for staff on this issue? Seeing none, I will uh, thank you for your report and open the public hearing on item number four, which is host approval of tax exempt. Um, revenue bonds for a project at 620 Olson Memorial Highway. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. I will move approval of item four. Item number four has been moved. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone else? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? Uh, that, that item is approved. We'll move on to item number five, which is uh, an interim use permit at 2800 North Pacific. Mr. Friends, welcome.
Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Andrew Friends. I'm a planner with CPED Land Use Design and Preservation. Before you today is an application for an interim use permit to allow a trailer rental use at 2800, 3016, and 3018 Pacific Street for a period of up to five years. The subject property is a large industrial site of approximately 11.6 acres located along the North Minneapolis Riverfront. I think uh, everyone is familiar with this site as the former uh, Northern Metals site. Uh, Northern Metals ceased operations, I'm sorry, ceased metal shredding at the property in 2019 and ceased all operations here in 2022 with its sale to the applicants. Um, since this photo was taken here, the large industrial building at the center of the site, which contained the metal shredding equipment, has been removed along with the piles of uh, scrap material and bunker walls um, that are visible here. Uh, today, the interior of the site is largely an open paved expanse with the two warehouse and office buildings uh, shown here bookending the north and south ends of the site. The property is currently located in the I-3 district, which is inconsistent with the future land use guidance that applies to the property, which is split approximately evenly between the production mixed use uh, future land use designation and the parks and open space future land use designation. Um, these land use designations reflect the city's policy of supporting the transition of the character of this area um, away from more intense industrial uses to a mix of light industrial, commercial, and residential uses. Um, and the City and Park Board's long-standing policy objective of making the riverfront, uh, including the, the North Minneapolis Riverfront, accessible to the public. With the effective date of the new zoning ordinance on July 1st, the site will be rezoned to the, P to the new PR1 district. Uh, but it's important to emphasize that uh, it is the provisions of the current I-3 district um, that apply to this application. The applicant is proposing to establish a trailer rental use at the property as an interim use. The proposed use has been determined by the zoning administrator to fall under the truck, trailer, boat, recreational vehicle, or mobile home sales service or rental uh, use designation in the current zoning code. Um, this use would be operated by a national firm which leases semi-trailers and similar equipment um, for use in commercial distribution on an extended basis. The use would not be open to individual members of the general public um, or for daily rentals. The applicant is proposing relatively limited changes to the site to accommodate the proposed interim use. Um, they're proposing to stripe the existing paved area to accommodate up to 190 semi-trailers and up to 21 smaller trailers or vans. Um, they would also be adding curbing surrounding this area, modifying three existing uh, curb cuts, one on 28th and two on Pacific, um, and making some minor landscaping improvements. I'm happy to go into any detail on the required findings as outlined in the staff report, uh, but speaking broadly, staff has found that the proposed interim use would not negatively impact nearby property or public health and would be compatible uh, with the applicable comprehensive gui uh, plan guidance that applies to the site. Um, while the proposed interim use does not support the development of the area with a mix of active production uses or support public access to the riverfront in the immediate future, it is primarily a passive use which is compatible with existing uses in the area um, and is not anticipated to have significant impacts to traffic um, or, or pollution. Establishing the use as an interim use rather than as a permanent use preserves the future opportunity um, for another use to move into the site, uh, to transition the site um, to uses that would be more in keeping with the production mixed use future land use designation and to provide public access to the riverfront. Staff is recommending approval of the interim use uh, permit uh, subject to the 11 conditions listed here. I'm happy to elaborate on any of these conditions uh, if additional clarification would be helpful. Uh, but generally, the uh, recommended conditions are intended to bring the project closer to compliance um, with the parking and loading uh, design and maintenance standards and the general landscaping and screening standards um, and to explicitly uh, state the, the scope of, of the use um, as intended to be approved. Um, so with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Friends? It looks like there's a couple. We'll start with Council Member Rainville, followed by Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Friends, could you talk a little bit more about how uh, the river front will be screened uh, by this lot? What, what will people see on a boat on the river or if they're living in Northeast Minneapolis and looked across the river. Uh, Councilmember Rainville, um, the, the applicant is not proposing any changes 
um, to the, uh, the, the riverfront itself. Um, so today, approximately two thirds of the site has sort of a, a naturally vegetated riverbank slope, um, and the applicant is not proposing to remove any of that vegetation. We've recommended as a condition of approval that that vegetation not be removed. Um, there are regulations that apply in the Shoreland Overlay District that prevent clear cutting in that area. Um, and then approximately the, you know, the, the remaining third or, or so of the site um, is uh, at, at the northern end is an existing uh, former barge terminal. Um, where, the, where the former barge terminal is present, there is not any screening between um, the, the area that would be used for this use and, and the river. So um, where the existing vegetation is, is present, I, I believe that vegetation would largely screen the, the parked trailers. Mm -hmm. um, but where the existing barge terminal is present, um, the, the trailers would, would be visible from uh, across the river. Thank you. Is, uh, and uh, I'd ask this of my colleagues, is it reasonable to expect screening uh, where the sparge area is, or is that unreasonable? Um, yeah, we would probably have to have that during the discussion, not the Q&A. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's a public hearing also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> First, I, I want to thank you for the presentation, and um, and uh, and I want to start off because I know there's, there are some community members who are going to speak uh, on this. That you know, this is not anyone's sort of dream activation of this site, right? I think that the everyone in the chamber, city staff, community folks on uh, uh, up here on the dais, um, you know, have been in a long storied sort of history with this site, and uh, would love to see it activated in some in some other way. But circumstances being what they are, I think that. You know, this also isn't the worst activation of this site, and I really want to thank staff for uh, all the work that you've done to, to ensure that. A um, few questions I just wanted to ask, and I, I think I know the answer to all these, but I want the public to know as well. Um, you know, uh, what kind of, um, you know, because of the history of the site, with this current use, what kind of emissions, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, can people expect, can the community expect from a use like this? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Um, and the applicant can speak to this a little bit as well when, mm -hmm. when they come up. But um, what the applicant has uh, communicated to us is that this is a largely passive use. These are not large volumes of semi-trailers coming and going from the site on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, there is not any type of, of processing um, or, or um, r repair to trucks uh, taking place on the site. In fact, the use is not um, even even truck rental is it's just the trailers, just the trailer. um, and so the, the applicant's description um, has been that you know the 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 companies that that their 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 tenant uh, works with lease large volumes of trailers for an extended period. So a trailer may be stored at the t site for a time and leave and, and be out on lease for three or four months at a time before returning to the mm -hmm. site. Um, in talking with the applicant and in talking um, with, with Public Works, um, with, uh, with the Traffic and Parking Division and Public Works, um, their staff, both, both in CPED and in Public Works, do not have a significant concern about the level of truck traffic or emissions associated with the tr truck traffic with this use. Um, with the recommended conditions, um, uh, we are um, ensuring that we're being explicit about the number of vehicles that can be stored on site, mm -hmm. um, that uh, you know, uh, loading and intermodal transfer is, is not authorized by this interim use permit, um, and that, that truck repair is not authorized by this interim use permit. So folks won't have to worry about idling diesel engines and, uh, you know, for, for hours on end, they won't have to worry about sort of a daily semi-truck dispatch kind of thing. That's not what this, this use is going to... Not, not at a high volume. Not at a high volume. Great, great. Um, and then I had one more question. Um, um, uh, you spoke on this, but uh, how long does the interim use last for? Uh, Councilmember Ellison, the interim use permit would be valid for up to five years. So June 6th of 2028 would be when the use expires. Um, there is no opportunity for any extension beyond that. That would be a, a hard stop to the, to the interim use. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I had. Thank you. I'm wondering, Mr. Fussy, if you could stand for a question, please. Thank you. I'm wondering, um, perhaps it's rhetorical, what legal basis do we have to deny this interim use permit? Um, as uh, Madam Chair and committee members, as is outlined in the thorough staff report, um, all of the findings that must be made 
um, with regard to conditional use permit um, have to be made in this case and then there are additional findings as well that need to be made so it's on the same footing uh, generally speaking as a conditional use permit um, and if they meet those um, findings then uh, the it, it the uh, permit needs must be granted thank you I like to describe it as a conditional use permit means it's allowed with conditions as much as I don't like it um, so I just want to lay that out there what our legal options are and they're not great um, other questions for staff or the city attorney seeing none we have a number of people signed up to speak and i will call on um, ms o'brien and the other folks from c uh, cmej first and then mr Cena, i'll let you speak last if that's sure sure everyone gets two minutes so he's not gonna have a lot of time okay, that's fine. mr steen welcome all right i'll take a breath uh thank you chair council members jake steen with larkin hoffman we represent zenith uh, Al, uh, Andrew did a great job in presenting this project. Um, as you know, Zenith acquired the property last year. Uh, since they've acquired the property, uh, we put approximately a million dollars into cleaning up the site. Uh, this was a very dirty site, as you can imagine. There's contamination. Uh, there's quite a bit of concrete on the site. It's about uh, six inches to 24 inches thick across the site. So uh, we've been putting a lot of work into it, meeting with a neighborhood group meeting with the park board meeting with city staff over the last year we are seeking an interim use permit to operate approximately seven acres of uh, solely trailer storage uh, this is not going to be a terminal this is as andrew described a very passive use uh, with any luck it will be vacant nearly all the time uh, if business is good uh, the northern building is a warehouse. Uh, it will continue to operate. The southern building is a contractor's office. I can tell you what it won't be. There will be no scrapping. Uh, there will be no debris storage. There will be no recycling. Uh, and again, Zenith has made a significant investment in keeping this project, uh, this property clean, and they will continue to do so moving forward. Uh, we are seeking the maximum five years under this IUP uh, with the understanding that this use may very well be and is likely a transitional use. Uh, we have started discussions with the park board about an easement along the river. Uh, as you know, the park board tends to move a little bit slower, uh, but we will continue those negotiations. Uh, we've also met with uh, city staff about coming up with a creative solution to ultimately uh, bring this project into alignment with your goals uh, and we will continue to have those conversations. Thank you, Mr. Steen. Thank you. Ms. O'Brien, you're next, followed by Mr. Henson, Ms. Clemente, and Ms. Ms. Jones. You have two minutes, ma'am. Hi, thank you, City Council. Oh. My name is Roxanne. I am a longtime Northside resident. I'm here um, on behalf of community members for environmental justice. I come here quite often. Nice to see you again. I wanted to say thank you to the city council once again for your support to community members who fought tirelessly on the front lines for over a decade to get Northern Meadows out of our communities. I believe when they left, they specifically mentioned my name as harassing them. So we know our organizing is what made this opportunity to access this parcel of land possible. And I'm here today to speak to this because the land has been purchased by Zenith Company before community members had the chance to know the land was up for lease and sale. I am grateful that this company is not a big polluter like Northern Metals. However, as someone who is a part of the Northside Green Zones since 2013, and help to push that forward. Um, I'm also a part of Parks and Power. I'm also a part of McAllister. We're here to protect the Mississippi waters um, and green spaces. And so I'm asking, and also I'm an organizer. So I'm asking you today to keep your promise to our community of North Minneapolis and work with us and with CMEJ to right this historic wrong. The city can buy this land from this company if we do this right. Community is often doing the hard work of organizing to protect our spaces and lives. And when it comes 
to being the leaders of how our communities are developed, we are always beat and bought out by big corporations and developers that have little to no connection or stake in our communities. We often are the last we often are the last to hear information pertaining to decisions that are being made about our environment. So I'm here today to address those who have the power to do something historic and to hold you to the promises you made with the green zones. Ooh, I got about 30 seconds. Can I do it? No? Just conclude. You can conclude. Okay. I'm just asking you here today to work with us. We believe that we can get the money from the federal with all the environmental justice dollars coming down to clean up the space start green businesses. We believe we can really do it. We need your help. Uh, we need you to reimagine what a community could look like if industry and polluters weren't holding us back and exploiting our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. Mr. Hansen, welcome. Hello. Please start uh, the clock. Thank you. Oh uh, Yeah, Mitchell, just here actually representing uh, myself as a Northsider. Um, yeah, just a few things, I guess, uh, with me. Um, you know, like having this, you know, like Zenith being, and I'll, you know, working with J.P. Morgan, and you know, basically investing in this land, saying they're gonna, whatever they're gonna do with it. Essentially, what I f feel like I see here is basically we're all aware that the Blue Line extension is coming through that area. What we want is investment is in the north side. We actually want things for north siders. Uh, what this seems like is a very targeted approach to just hold on to that land and, uh, you know, just make the Green Line extension less, you know. You know, less viable for North Siders to live in. Um, you know, and what they also say, you know, like one of the things that they really focus on is like sustainability and carbon usage reduction, which everybody kind of does nowadays. But um, I don't really see how that use fits that, uh, you know, that intended purpose. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much um, all I have to say. Just kind of echoing, um, you know, what was been said before. Just there's a lot of land acknowledgments in that that people, basically people are saying. Can we just acknowledge land like this time and actually be like, okay, we're actually going to do something about it instead of just talking about it? Um, thank you. Thank you for being here, sir. Ms. Clemente. Is there Christina Clemente? Okay, then uh, Justice Jones. Welcome. Hello. Hello. This is my first time here, but I've worked with Roxanne for about three years with community members for environmental justice. Um, I'm going to second what Roxanne said, and I'm going to add to it a little bit as well. Um, we already didn't get the opportunity with Upper Harbor Terminal and would like to enter into conversation with a company first and then the city and very possibly the state with all of the EJ dollars um, coming down the pipeline to help clean up and start growing green businesses with federal, state, and local dollars. We're confident that the community can raise the dollars to help purchase the land, lead the visioning, organize and design a development that would benefit community equitably and um, justly. And I ask that you hear us today and um, hold that commitment to us and reimagine what communities could look like. I have a little more to say. Um, in what I heard folks saying, I heard no daily use for residents and no public access to that site. Um, and I heard we have to wait another five years to get that access to the river when Roxanne has already put in 10 years of work, which then would bring us to over a decade to 15 years of waiting to have access to the river as Northsiders. Um, I also want to say that light industry, light industrial pollution is still industrial pollution regardless, and the fact that that site sits in the center of an industrial corridor that is constantly pushing out pollution, that does, it does make a difference even if it's just a tiny little amount. Um, while it might not be immediately harmful to us as residents, it's still not helpful for us that live there. Um, and the lack of public access means that we're again denied access to the river. Um, much like I just said about U UHT and it sitting amongst other polluters, the goal is that we remove the industrial corridor overall, at least that's my goal as an organizer in North Minneapolis, um, and provide access, which was promised, but this along with other projects along the corridor like UHT don't meet community needs for access. And in the past, we've had folks promise or allow a certain level of pollution, and I'm afraid we might not know exactly how much will be there until you're actually there. Um, and so, yeah, that's my time. But thank you so much for Good listening. Job. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone else here who has not had a chance to speak who'd like to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, just wanted to thank community members, wanted to thank um, everyone for, for, for coming through, especially Roxanne, who has been in this fight for a long time. And I guess I'll say, um, I, was, I would encourage, I saw some cards exchanging, I think, from up here. I, and I'm glad that um, Mr. Steen, uh, you and your clients would be willing to talk to community. There's a huge history here. There's a long history here. Um, that probably even goes for, back further than, than Roxanne and, and other folks. And, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, but I know that it can be easy to say, hey, it's a, it's a parcel of land on the riverfront. We're just gonna use it how we're gonna use it. Um, but I think acknowledging that story, that history, um, and, and being in communication with, with community um, could, uh, uh, could really open up some opportunities um, uh, you know, and, and help us reimagine how we activate that space as both Roxanne and, and, um, and uh, Justice put it. So I uh, uh, so want to encourage that. I'm glad that that's happening. Um, uh, I want to thank staff because this could have been a conditional, this could have been a use into perpetuity, right? This could have been a permanent use. Um, and staff uh, really worked hard to make sure that that wasn't the case um, along with the applicant. And so I want to thank the applicant and thank staff for, for coming to that conclusion. Um, we want to be able to create access on our riverfront. North Minneapolis deserves that access. It should have never been taken. Um, and so uh, there's, a, there's a window of opportunity here, and, and, and I think that we're all interested in making sure that we don't um, let, us, uh, let it pass us by. And, uh, you know, and, and the use is up to five years, right? Uh, but it could be less than that. You know, might be a, a heavy lift, but it could be less than that. Uh, and so, uh, so I want to encourage us all to sort of dream big in that, in that regard. With that, uh, I will move approval uh, of the application uh, submitted, uh, uh, and um, and uh, hope my colleagues have heard the community today and will support that motion. Further comments or questions? I want to also thank Ms. O'Brien for the work that you've done in this area. I have seen tremendous change. Even though it doesn't feel like that to you, your work matters, and we hear you. And, and you know, I've known you a long time. And I have known you to really be focused on results. And I think that um, we are making progress slowly but surely with a moratorium on industrial uses, with the incredible work of our planning staff as it pertains to having no in heavy industrial uses in the city at all. And we will continue to chip away until the river is once again what it should be, which is recreational for a majority of users, especially in North Minneapolis. So I just want to commend you and your team. It's so nice to see that you have new young people working with you, although you're pretty young too. And um, I think that this is uh, kind of an un unfortunate situation. I don't want to say it could be worse, uh, because not great is not great. Um, but because of your work, we're not facing a situation right now where we're talking about another conderator type project. So I just wanted to acknowledge. I would want to acknowledge the work of all the people who have been involved. Uh, Mr. Steen, we know you. We've known you for many years. You have been one of us at points in time. I want to thank you for your collaboration. You understand how important it is to council members that the people working on the green zones in North Minneapolis, that their voices are heard and that it's not just lip service. And so I appreciate the way you've represented your client and urge you to continue to work with them in order to ensure that in the future, Roxanne's children are able to use that part of the river for a more recreational use, that would be equity. And so I just wanted to note that as well. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I will be voting for this and I don't wanna stand in the way of passing it, uh, but I would, ask you, Mr. Seen, to talk to your client about perhaps screening that one parcel where the barge, uh, the old barge, uh, is it a landing, a barge landing, is that what it is? Barge mooring, to be consistent. And uh, lastly, I do want to uh, thank the, the neighbors who are here today, the community. Uh, I remember when the Condorator, uh, that had to be back in the early 80s when I my community was involved with that because it was a terrible thing to put on the river. It got stopped and there has been progress, so, so don't give up. Uh, where I live used to be a roofing factory, used to be a lumber yard. Change does happen, it's never fast enough, but it does happen. The city is committed to helping your neighbor, so just don't give up, keep pushing us. Council Member Chavez. Uh, Chair Goodman, thank you. Roxanne and to the North Sider folks here, just wanna say thank you for being here today. 
I've had a very similar situation in South Minneapolis with the Roof Depot site, so I understand the struggle to fight you know, for, for the land that is ours. So just want to let you know that you have my full support in any process that you need to move forward with and figuring out how we as a city can do better. So thank you for your advocacy, thank you for pushing us, and thank you for like, pushing our city to do better when it comes to environmental racism, addressing that, and fighting for environmental justice. So thank you, you have my full support. On the motion to approve the staff recommendation, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number six. Um, I will note there's going to be a staff presentation. Uh, we will open the public hearing and continue it until the at least July 11th. Um, but I will invite uh, Lisa to come up and give her report. Are, is that what you'd like to do, Mr. Hansen? Do you want to have a report? Chair Goodman, we'd, we'd like to defer the report till the next um, okay. available uh, meeting. Thank you for correcting yep. me. I will note then that we are on item number six, which is a land sale at 19 East 26th Street to Partners in Property Commercial Land Trust. Um, this is a public hearing that is going to be uh, continued. Um, I just want to make sure I have that correct. Um, but if there's anyone here to speak to this issue now, we are happy to hear you. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public here. Uh, we'll continue the public hearing uh, and move this to at least July 11th. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, that has been continued. We will now move on to our quasi-judicial public hearing, which is item number seven, a certificate of appropriateness appeal at 117-125 First Street North. Aaron, Ms. Quee, did I pronounce that wrong? K. It's K. K. Sorry. Thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. My name is Erin Kay, and I'm a city planner in the Historic Preservation subsection of the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development. I am here today to present an appeal of two conditions in the Heritage Preservation Commission's May 2nd, 2023 approval of a Certificate of Appropriateness to amend a previously approved Certificate of Appropriateness application to modify alterations to the foundry building and demolish more than 60% of the Roe Wolf or Blacksmith building at 117, 125 First Street North in the Minneapolis Warehouse Historic District and St. Anthony Falls Historic District. Staff received one public comment, which has been shared with you. I will begin with a high level overview of the project and then explain the rationale for the two conditions. This project, known as the Commutator Foundry Development Project, or West Hotel, is located at 117 to 125 First Street North and is currently under construction. The project includes the rehabilitation of two historic buildings and integration with a new six-story hotel addition. The previous Certificate of Appropriateness application was approved in 2019. The subject of today's appeal is the design of a new entry for the hotel on one of the historic buildings, known as the Commutator Foundry. It was previously approved to be located on the one-story shed addition to this building, which was constructed in 1919. Since 2019, the design has been refined and was presented to the Heritage Preservation Commission on May 2nd of this year. The proposed design includes a recessed entry, a canopy that extends over the sidewalk, metal panels attached to the brick walls, and a projecting metal frame around the window to the right of the entry. In staff's analysis and the Heritage Preservation Commission's discussion of the project, one aspect of the design was found to not comply, comply with the design guidelines for the Minneapolis Warehouse Historic District and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, which is the metal panels. The metal panels are proposed to cover one window above the entry, part of one window to the right of the entry, and part of the brick, including an original brick pilaster. The design guidelines state that distinctive architectural features shall be preserved, original and historically significant windows shall be retained and repaired, and windows on primary facades shall not be removed or blocked for any reason. Starting with the window above the door, historical photographs from around the 1970s show that there was originally a large window in the location of this proposed entry. In the left photo, it is the far left window with plywood covering the bottom half. In the right photo, it is the left window on the one-story portion near the middle of the photograph. In 2014, Google Street View shows that the bottom half of the window is gone and more bricks were removed below the window. 
The applicant provided a contemporary photograph taken in January 2023 from the inside of the building that shows remnants of a deteriorating window above a makeshift doorway. The date of this window has not been confirmed, but it is possible that it dates from the period of significance for the Minneapolis Warehouse Historic District, which is 1865 to 1930, or the St. Anthony Falls Historic District, which extends to 1941. The applicant previously had a consultant conduct a historic window survey, which recommended that this window be replaced in kind. Covering the window with metal panels does not comply with the design guidelines or the Secretary of the Interior standards, and replacement is recommended. Returning to the proposed design, the metal panels are proposed to cover portions of the brick, including a pilaster, which the Heritage Preservation Commission considered to be a distinctive feature of the building. Therefore, covering the brick does not comply with the design guidelines or the Secretary of the Interior standards and may result in impacts to the brick. Lastly, the metal panels are proposed to cover part of the window to the right of the entry. The size of the window opening is original, as shown in the previous historical photographs. As part of the project, the large windows on this building are being replaced in kind. Covering part of the window does not comply with the design guidelines or the Secretary of the Interior standards. Therefore, staff recommended and the Heritage Preservation Commission acted upon the following two conditions that are currently under appeal. Number one, the historic window openings and brick walls shall not be covered by metal panels or any other material on the new west elevation entry of the commutator foundry shed. And number two, the historic steel window above the entry shall be replaced in kind on the new west elevation entry of the commutator foundry shed. The applicant and appellant has presented additional information pertaining to these conditions for your consideration, and I'd like to highlight two parts. First, the applicant asserts that the canopy, as approved by the Heritage Preservation Commission, cannot be installed if the window above the door has to be replaced instead of removed. Second, the placement of the metal panels is intended to help with wayfinding, so clientele can more easily find the entrance. The applicant intends to place signage on the metal panels. Please note that signage was not included in this application for approval. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to stay for questions. The applicant is also here and available to answer questions. Are there any questions for staff on item number seven? Seeing none, thank you so much for your report. Uh, we will move to the appellant. Uh, generally, we give the appellant about 10 minutes uh, to make their presentation, and then if there's anyone here to speak as it pertains to the public hearing, you're welcome to do that afterwards. And so I will turn it over to Ms. Anderson, and Mr. Wilson, who's here today. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman and uh, committee members. Uh, my name is David Wilson, and I'm one of the three developers uh, that are working on the Commutator Foundry project. Uh, also with me is uh, Lauren Anderson. She's our historic preservation consultant from New History and has been working with us to ensure that we preserve the historic buildings on the site properly. Um, we're here this afternoon uh, to, whoop, I need to, uh, we are here this afternoon to request that the City Council waive two conditions that were included in the HPC's approval for the design of our hotel's main entrance. Uh, the first uh, condition uh, is uh, we're requesting that it be waived and that you grant permission to cover brick masonry and a portion of one replacement window with approximately 100 square feet of reversible metal panels to provide signage and entrance identification for the hotel. The second condition we're asking be waived is the requirement that we replace the partially demolished window that is located above the intended entrance to the hotel. As background for the request, I'll provide a brief overview of the, of the project that we're working on. The uh, project is a mixed-use development including a hotel and retail space. It covers four parcels of land at the intersection of 1st Street North and 2nd Avenue North in North Loop in Ward 3. The project preserves two historic buildings and includes a new eight-story building. Two of those uh, stories are actually underground for parking. The hotel, named the West Hotel, will have 123 guest rooms, and the project includes two restaurants, two cocktail lounges, a bakery, and event space. Construction is about 60% complete, and when open, we expect to employ approximately 150 people. Project has been reviewed by the HPC three times, and today's request is the final preservation approval that we contemplate in order to complete the project. 
I want to just orient where this entrance is for uh, the committee. The main entrance to the hotel is on the west side of the building, mid-block on 2nd Avenue North. This location has already been approved by the HPC. This entrance is existing. Uh, it was created by a pri prior property owner sometime between 2011 and 2014, based on uh, uh, photographs that we have, have in our possession. This project overall has eight different building entrances that are to be used by the public. Our architects chose this entrance as the hotel's main entry for various reasons related to traffic flow and et cetera. But most importantly, we wanted the front entry to the hotel to be adjacent to the historic shed building because we intend to open up that shed as the uh, lobby for the hotel and have it open for public use. Uh, Lauren and I will now walk through the seven reasons that we are requesting that you waive the two HPC conditions to the design. Lauren? Thank you, David. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Lauren Anderson. I, I'm here today uh, representing New History, the historic building reuse consultant who's been working um, on the commutator project. Um, we'd like to first just briefly clarify a misunderstanding that arose during last month's HPC meeting after the applicant presentation and public comment period was closed related to the remnant window above the proposed west entrance. Um, so as David mentioned, um, and Aaron did as well, staff did as well, the window as it exists today is only a remnant of a larger historic window that was once located at this spot, as you can see in the photo on the left side of this slide. The HPC suggested during the meeting that the removal of most of that historic window might have occurred during the historic district's period of significance, implying that the window remnant that we see there today could be a historic condition. Um, however, you can see from the images at the center and right of this slide, which were taken from Google Earth, that that's not the case. Um, in fact, the removal of the majority of the historic window was a recent alteration that happened sometime between June 2011 and September 2014. During the period of significance, this historic window was always a full window and never a partial window as we see there today. Um, the existing partial re window remnant is therefore not a historic condition, and that's one of the reasons that we're requesting that the council lift the HPC's condition number two that requires we replace this remnant in kind. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, the second reason uh, that we are requesting uh, that these conditions be waived is that the proposed metal paneling is designed to serve a dual purpose, uh, both uh, to uh, highlight the entrance to the hotel, but also as signage for the hotel. Um, and the design of these metal panels fits within the maximum size that is permitted by city ordinance for signs. And by using this, uh, these metal panels as a dual purpose to frame the entrance, highlight the entrance, and as signage, we won't have to put any other signage on the building blocking any other of the historic fabric of the building. Another uh, reason that we would like to highlight um, regarding our, our request uh, is that the uh, North Loop Neighborhood Association uh, does support our proposed design for the entry. Um, we have uh, met with the North Loop Neighborhood Association on a regular basis, uh, reviewing with them our design and construction uh, and getting their input on the project. Um, we uh, did review this design with the, HP, uh, with the North Loop Neighborhood Association's Planning and Zoning Committee uh, earlier this spring. Uh, and we received a letter of support for this design. Unfortunately, the, the letter was routed to the wrong city uh, office, and so the HPC commissioners didn't have this uh, in front of them when they were reviewing this project. Um, I would like to note that Blake Peterson, who is uh, uh, the co-chair for the North Loop Neighborhood Association's Board of Directors Planning and Zoning Committee, is in attendance today uh, to support our, our request for uh, peeling and waiving these two conditions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peterson, for joining us. The, the fourth reason that we would like to highlight uh, in our appeal is that uh, the, the metal paneling and framing is, is 
necessary so that it's clear where the main entrance to this large project is. Um, uh, it, wayfinding is really important, particularly for a commercial establishment where a lot of the guests may not be from the area. And as this is a hotel, we're expecting that many people from outside of our community will be visiting us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the project has eight public entrances, three on the Second Avenue side and four on the First Street side. And our hotel operator has stressed that it's really important that it be really easy and clear for guests arriving at the hotel. So our designers have really designed this, uh, this entry to make it very clear where the entrance is, while at the same time using materials that are very compatible with the historic architecture and making sure that it blends into the rest of the fabric of the neighborhood. The, our fifth, uh, our fifth uh, reason for requesting this uh, uh, appeal is that the, uh, the canopy that has been proposed is a very simple metal panel uh, canopy that projects over the sidewalk to protect guests. There are no support posts that would obstruct the sidewalk. This has been approved by the HPC. However, our architects tell us that in order to install this canopy, they need to put the support in the space where that remnant window is. So without, so if we have to put the remnant window back above this door, we will have to redesign the canopy and likely have posts that will come down and cause an obstruction on the sidewalk. I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren. I'd briefly just like to also mention and emphasize that the, the design of this canopy and the metal paneling has been carefully designed to avoid damage to historic materials um, and to be reversible, meaning that it could be removed in the future if needed. Um, and specifically, the paneling that's proposed will be installed using steel angles that are actually installed into mortar joints and not into the historic masonry itself, um, allowing the paneling to be removed in the future if needed and preventing damage to the brick. Um, and I also just did want to point out, too, that we are covering a portion of a historic window opening to the right of the door, as you see in that um, image. However, the full window opening beneath will be maintained, and a full replica window will be installed in that opening, and that will be vi visible from the interior, um, from the public space. Thank you, Lauren. Um, our last uh, point that we would like to, uh, to share is that the, we've had really, really great architects working with us to design this project. And the architects who have designed this entrance are committed to historic preservation. They have actually worked on many historic buildings in the past. And it's intended to actually highlight and bring to life the historic exterior of the building. Uh, it is really, ex this, this, I will wrap up, this project's really expensive and uh, maintaining the design that our architects have brought, which is really set uh, by this entry, is super important to the commercial viability of the project. We appreciate your consideration, council members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we will now open the public hearing on item number seven, which is an appeal of a certificate of appropriateness. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Please step forward and state your name and address for the record. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Blake Peterson. Uh, I've lived in the North Loop for about five years now. Um, I'm co-chair of the Planning and Zoning Committee. Uh, these guys are the best neighbor one could ask for as far as keeping everyone up to date. I mean, they literally picked up a building and moved it just to preserve the history of it. And uh, it was a misfortune that the letter did not get to the HPC. And I'm just here to say the North Loop Neighborhood Association completes, completely supports this entire motion to appeal. And, and that's really all I have for you. Thank you, you so much it. for taking the time to be here of today. Course. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will move that we, uh, uh, we approve the uh, appeal and allow the canopy to go. I find that a, a partial window uh, to, to utilize that space for the canopy will make the hotel more efficient. And I'm particularly grateful for the partnership that is investing $82 million into the city of Minneapolis. So with that, I move for approval. Approval has been moved of the um, appeal of Mr. Wilson. Are there further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you so much for your investment and for being here today. We will now move on to our two discussion items. 
Um, noting first item number 22, which is the inclusionary zoning annual report and unified housing policy updates. Ms. Kramer, welcome. Hello. And I believe there is a report, a written report in front of everybody as well. Oh, there was. Yes, there is. All right, good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. My name is Haley Kramer, and I am a senior project coordinator in residential finance. Uh, the purpose of my presentation today is to give a brief overview of the inclusionary zoning policy and the results from 2022. The permanent IZ policy went into effect on January 1 of 2020. As a refresher, IZ applies to new residential projects with 20 or more units that submit a completed land use application. It requires that new projects provide some level of affordable housing on site or another public benefit, such as paying a fee that goes into the city's affordable housing trust fund or Minneapolis Homes program. The project pictured on this slide is an example of a market rate project that was subject to inclusionary zoning in 2022. This project is located at 1207 Glenwood in Ward 5 and will provide 10 affordable units on site at 60% AMI. IZ applies to both rental and ownership projects and is just one of our many affordable housing tools. To date, there are no ownership projects subject to inclusionary zoning, so the remainder of the presentation will focus on rental projects. The rental IZ requirements include both on-site compliance options and alternative options. On-site options include providing 8% of units affordable at or below 60% AMI, or providing 4% of units affordable at or below 30% AMI, or providing 20% of units affordable at 50% AMI for 30 years with revenue loss offset financial assistance in the form of TIF. Alternative options include paying a cash fee, producing required units off-site, or donating land to the city. Um, those last two options are subject to city council approval. So here are some highlights of the outcomes in 2022. 21 rental projects totaling 2,629 units received building permits and were subject to inclusionary zoning. 11 of these projects were large-scale market rate projects, and eight of those 11 are providing are providing affordable units on site and will be providing a total of 84 units at 60% AMI. One project chose to provide four affordable units on site at 30% AMI, and two projects chose to pay an in lieu fee instead of providing the affordable units. The project pictured here is the Duffy 2.0, which is a large adaptive reuse market rate project with a total of 358 units in Ward 3. As part of their IZ obligation, they are providing 28 units affordable at 60% AMI. Additionally, three small-scale projects with a total of 76 units were permitted. These projects were temporarily exempt from IZ because they fall in the 20 to 49 unit range. The project on this slide is known as American Spirit and it will provide 23 units of market rate housing in Ward 3. And finally, we had seven rental projects with a total of 1,166 units that were permitted but exempt because they are regulated affordable housing, which means they use financing such as from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. The project pictured here is Curry Commons, and it is providing 187 units of affordable housing in Ward 5. I think we've presented this before, but as a reminder, staff does maintain an online dashboard that allows us to share cumulative IZ data. So this dashboard is featured on the city's data source webpage and serves as a resource to staff, the development community, and the general public about this work. As shown in the screenshot provided on this slide, to date we have permitted 24 large-scale projects that were subject to inclusionary zoning. 19 of those projects are providing a total of 189 affordable units and 243 affordable student bedrooms on site. Additionally, four projects have paid an in lieu fee and one project is providing 95 affordable units off site. So next steps. 
Per the direction of the Unified Housing Policy, staff will complete a full review of the inclusionary zoning policy between 20, 2024 and 2025. Any updates or changes to the policy will be recommended to the council at that time. Additionally, staff continue to monitor compliance with inclusionary zoning, particularly as projects move through the lease-up process. This monitoring is done in partnership with a third-party agency and ensures that tenants are income qualified and that they are moving into the appropriate units. The project featured on this slide is the Fieldhouse Dinkytown Student Housing Project. This project received its permit in 2021, but I included them in this presentation because in 2022, they celebrated full lease-up of all of their units, which included eight affordable IZ units and 56 affordable IZ student bedrooms, which was a win for IZ. And that concludes my presentation today. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Ms. Kramer, you did a great job. That Thank was you. a really great presentation. <laughs> I think you did a nice job presenting it and showing us some slides with examples as well as the dashboard. Congratulations to you. Thank, Thank you. you for presenting in front of us. We'll see if there are any questions from members of the committee. Uh, we had asked for an update on an annual basis. It seems like it's working pretty well. And uh, we got to see a newer, younger staff person do a presentation and work on something very important. I would say it's a win-win all around. Um, are there comments or questions without any? Council Member Rainville. I, I too want to thank you. This I could see that you were nervous when you started, but you ended as a complete <laughs> pro. So good for you. Congratulations. Thank you for your thank professionalism. You. <laughs> So the motion here, like the other one, will be just to receive and file this presentation. I will move to receive and file. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is received and filed. And thank everyone on the housing team for all of your hard work on this. We'll move on then to our last item on the agenda, which is also an update receive and file by Ms. Lingo with regard to TNC rate study. Ms. Lingo, thank you. PowerPoint presentations aren't always my best friend. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I am Amy Lingo, Manager of Business Licensing, and I am here to present the Transportation Driver Minimum Wage Equivalent Legislative Directive. The directive was to calculate a minimum wage equivalent for app-based driver and a minimum um, fee for rides. In 2022, Seattle implemented a minimum wage equivalent for app-based drivers. The fee structure was finalized at 64 cents per minute, $1.50 per mile for active passenger platform rides with a minimum of $5.62 per trip. Seattle also had a year to conduct a survey um, with all the TNC drivers to assess the costs, such as gas, insurance, maintenance as well. So we used their numbers for a lot of our homework. In 2018, New York City implemented a minimum wage equivalent and that led to a 52.9 cent per minute and a $1.61, sorry, per mile. So looking at our minimum wage equivalent, business licensing staff took into account the Minneapolis large employer minimum wage at 15.19 per hour, which breaks to 25.3 cents per minute. Seattle's minimum wage is 17.27, which breaks down to 28 cents per minute. New York City's minimum wage is 15 an hour, which breaks down to an even 25 cents a minute. So a 25 cent per passenger platform minute for all passenger platform time for one trip and a dollar 40 per passenger platform mile for all passenger platform miles per trip would provide a minimum wage equivalent for app based rideshare drivers. An example using very easy math, not geographically appropriate at all for a 10 mile trip that took 10 minutes would be a wage of $16 and 50 cents. There is a minimum fee um, provided of $5, and the driver should receive 80% of that fee if the ride is canceled after they have accepted that. There are no fees generated for declined rides. This is the same that we have for a taxi minimum. They have a minimum of $5. And then here is a, just a little grid for a little visual reference 
of the three cities' um, minimum driver rates. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time, and I stand for any questions. I'll see if there's any questions for you, Ms. Lingo. Uh, Council Member um, Chavez, followed by Council Member Chagtai. Thank you, Chair Goodman. I do have questions for staff. I just want to thank CPED for their, CPED and you, uh, uh, Amy, for the work that you're doing on this study and for the work we're receiving on this Uber and Lyft ordinance. I do have some questions in, its regard, in, in regards to clarification on this policy, on this study. Do we know what factors were considered in establishing the per mile rate? Uh, I think the goal of a minimum wage equivalent is to ensure that workers earning a minimum wage uh, that we take other factors into consideration. For example, I think right here you, you accurately reflected that they are earning only 40 cents per hour that they, that they work, but there's also cost that I don't know if, if maybe this clarification you could give me were inc included in the study. For example, uh, the costs of you know some of the safety issues that they have, some of the costs for miles per rate, some of the costs of the gas that these workers have to pay, and I just want to know if there was any work that this study did to incorporate some of those costs into the 25 cents. Thank you for that question through the chair, um, <coughs> Councilmember Chavez. So as I stated in slide three, Seattle had a year to conduct a survey where they assess yep. things such as gas, insurance, vehicle repairs. We did not have that time, so we used their math. Um, and so we kind of added that in, and then we adjusted the rates that they had based off of the cost of living difference that we have. So Seattle has a 12% higher minimum wage, and their cost of living is a 34% higher. So we added those into our calculations. So the minute per mile does reflect that, but I don't have the exact breakdown because we, don't ha we didn't have that length of time to do that mm -hmm. full study on how much those costs are. So we used existing precedent to come up with those numbers. Okay. Thank you, that's the only question I had. I did wanna, uh, and that's that's the only question I have for you, uh, Amy, so I appreciate your work on that. And my staff will be reaching back out in, in regards to this specific study in ways that we can incorporate some of this work into our policy. I did wanna thank the drivers from Uber and Lyft that are here. Just want to thank you. I know a lot of you have been continuing to show up at the Capitol asking for basic dignity and basic rights uh, as workers here in our city. And want to let you know that as we move this policy forward in the coming weeks and months, that my office is going to stay engaged with the workers and making sure that we can pass a strong policy that protect your wages, that you are paired, paid fairly, and that you're respected in this city and that we're gonna be holding Uber and Lyft accountable for the work that they're doing. And they're gonna be here at City Hall. They're gonna be lobbying and trying to stop us from doing this work, but just wanna let you know that the work that you showed at the Capitol, uh, that you are willing to stand up for your rights, is the kind of work that uh, our, our country, quite frankly, is looking to and that we as council members are here to support. So just wanna thank the workers as well. But, and, and thank you, Amy, for the full work you're doing. My office will be reaching out specifically more on this study. Council Member Shaktai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Lingo, um, I just want to make sure I understood uh, some of the what, what you presented on um, correctly in your, your answer to Council Member Chavez's question. So that 25 cents per mile number calculated for Minneapolis. 25 cents per minute. Per minute, sorry. Yes. Per minute. Um, calculated for... Um, for Minneapolis is inclusive of gas insurance, wear and tear, those other factors that were included in Seattle's formula? That's the mile. So the minute is driver's time. The per mile is more equivalent to the, the effects of the vehicle. So that would where the insurance would fold in is in that per mile, that $1.40. Got it. So it'd be both of those combined. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Understood. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, and I I know there's a there's like an open ordinance um, on this as well. Uh, so I I understand you're here to present to receive and file. And I also know we have a lot of community members and impacted workers that are in the room today that have waited now uh, for an hour and a half for us to to get to this item. So. Um, I just want to make sure that 
that we are all understanding what we're doing here today correctly. You are fulfilling um, a legislative directive that was given to you to calculate the minimum wage equivalent, and today we are not taking any action on this. Chairman Chartakti, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Chartakti, it would be fair, though, to ask Ms. Lingo if she could make her report available to everybody in the room who wouldn't have it electronically, because obviously something was written down because we saw it in a slide. Is it possible to get copies of this report? Absolutely. Okay, so is it possible to do while, like, if they hang out for 10 minutes, you can pass out copies and make copies. Could someone assist with that so they could have copies before they leave? Because I think it would be hard to look that up online or have to review the video or that kind of thing. Maybe Patrick can assist with that. Can you assist with that? Okay. Great. So um, what we're attempting to tell the drivers in the room is that we'd like to provide you with a copy of the analysis in, on paper instead of looking at the slides online, um, just so you, the, in the interest of transparency. And I, that's what I heard Council Member yes. Chantai kind of asking for. Yeah. So if it, then I think the conclusion we've gotten to here is if people will just wait a few minutes, we're going to get printed copies here for you. Okay. So then you can have something to, to look at directly. Okay. Great. Great. Okay, so are there other questions for staff or comments? Okay, seeing none, this is also a receive and file item, but we will be presenting a copy of this uh, analysis to the people in the room because Ms. Lingo is gonna work with Mr. Sadler to get copies made behind the scenes right now and we'll get them out to people before the end of the meeting. Uh, before we end the meeting, I just want to make an announce. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna move to receive and file the study. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, that item is received and filed. I just wanted to make one announcement. Beginning on Friday, June 9th, Animal Care and Control is hosting a Clear the Shelter weekend where we're hoping that all the adoptable animals will find their forever homes. Anyone wishing to participate can visit the shelter from 1 to 5 on Friday and 11 to 3 on Saturday to be partnered with a staff member uh, to help them find the right pet. Um, it's important to try to get these pets out of our shelter because they're better with people than with each other in cages or crates, and all information is available online. With that, seeing no b further business before us and without objection, I will consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you all for being here. This year's theme, which is 